Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another showing of the Cosmic Pie. Uh, as you may notice, we're doing things a little differently today because I'm here alone in the, the nice little studio, and Wayne, you are somewhere else, but we're learning how to zoom in. Yes, Robert, I am on vacation on the east coast of Canada. Can you hear me, Robert, from such a long distance away? We can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> and I put my hands up to my mouth like I'm talking all that dirt way. Well, but, no, I can't, I can't say we're broadcasting live from the campus of North you know, University of North Dakota anymore. Right. Well, you, you can't. Have. I am. So yes, beautiful exactly. campus of University of North Dakota. And uh, I suppose we should go through all that disclaimer stuff that we usually do, that the opinions and uh, everything expressed here are those of Wayne and myself. They are not the opinions of the state, uh, our state of North Dakota or the county of Grand Forks or anything else, just us. So uh, that's out of the way. So I don't know, you're usually doing this part. <laughs> Well, it is episode uh, 25, if I'm not mistaken. It is episode 25. So. And we do have a live chat that's running. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, let's see, live chat. And we've already got uh, Mizuho Schwalm uh, saying good afternoon. And uh, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> Grand Forks is so lovely. And I understand where you are. And it's so lovely today. It's kind of rainy here. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, we do have a system that's moving in. It should be here probably in a few hours. It will start raining. But, uh, you know, we've had several days of nice weather here, so I am not complaining about that. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, I guess we should dig right in. And what are we going to be talking about today? Well, we're going to speak about showers also, Robert, but it's a different type of shower than the one that's on its way here and the one that you have currently. Right. And this is a meteor shower. Okay, so I'll bring up the first slide, the Perseid meteor, meteor shower. Yes, so this is an annual event. The Perseid meteor shower has been going on for hundreds, if not thousands of years. In fact, there have been uh, sort of records that people have written down about the fact that around this time of the year, around August the 12th or so, that there's been an increase in the number of shooting stars that you can see in the sky. And eventually we figured out that it was a result of debris essentially that gets le left behind by a comet, a comet Swift-Tuttle, in orbit around the sun. And I recall way back, this would have been in the early 1990s, that that comet made a fresh sort of run by the inner part of the solar system. And because of that, it deposited, if you like, more debris along its orbit. And the Earth happens to run across that orbit at around August the 12th each year, which is why the Perseid meteor shower is so predictable. Now, the way these showers are, the peak is sort of the night this year is the night of August 12th into the, uh, the morning of August the 13th. And typically you can see Perseids for several weeks before and even after the peak, but the peak's always the best. And the reason for that is that we get typical numbers, roughly about 60 shooting stars per hour. Now that assumes several things. For example, it assumes that you're in a dark location. So if you want to watch the Perseid meteor shower, it's not like looking at the full moon and you can see that anywhere in the earth as long as it's clear. It doesn't matter if you're in the middle of a large city or not. But the Perseid meteor shower, to see it in all of its glory, you really want to get away from the city lights. So if you have the opportunity and the weather's clear, get outside whatever urban areas that happen to be nearby you and get into a dark location. And that will increase the number of shooting stars that you will see per hour. And you'll reach those values you know, of, of near 60 or so. And, and the, other, the other thing that's important is that the Perseid meteor shower are coming from a certain direction in the sky, and that's towards the constellation Perseus. That's where the name Perseid meteor shower comes from. And the constellation Perseus, at least for sort of mid-northern latitudes where we're located, uh, that rises fully sort of late in the evening. So anytime after midnight is usually the best time to look for the shooting stars. But of course, if you can't stay up that late because you have to get up early for go to work or whatever, uh, also go out as soon as it gets dark and look for the shooting star, even if you only have an hour or two before you have to turn in. 
Um, also, of course, where you're located, Robert, and also where I am, if you do go out, the best thing I find is if you have a lawn chair, like a sort of a, a cot that folds out and you can lay right back on it, look straight up. That's always a good thing. And also watch out for bugs like mosquitoes. So oh, yeah. In insect repellent. <laughs> It's a good idea. You know, the worst thing you have is mosquitoes buzzing in your ears when you're trying to look at the sky, right? It uh, <laughs> makes you want to get up and run inside right away. But right. try to stick it out the best you can. Wear, and... insect, wear insect repellent, you know, to keep the mosquitoes from biting you. Because you never know, you know, mosquitoes do carry diseases in certain areas of the world, including North Dakota and even around here, the West Nile, for example. West so Nile. Yeah. yeah, so you want to minimize, you know, mosquito bites if you can. Right. And... uh I've always heard something, and is it true for this one, that it's actually usually better to get up early in the morning before dawn to look at a meteor shower? Uh, for this one, right, it would depend where the, as we say, the radiant is located. So you could see on that slide that you're still showing, hopefully, yep. uh, where the radiant, that is the location that the meteor uh, shooting stars seem to be coming from, is in the constellation Perseus. And that just happens to rise higher and higher as you wait, you know, past midnight more and more until, of course, uh, dawn arise and then you wouldn't be able to see them anymore because they get washed out with the brightness of the, the sky from the sun. And so it is true, right, that, that if you look later in the evening, so very early morning before the sun starts to come up, you'll get the much better view. But of course, that depends on what you can do. If you need to go to work, you don't want to go in with two hours sleep. So you <laughs> might want to try earlier in the evening if you can. Right. And also it depends on the weather, right? If you look up and it's completely cloudy, if you can't see the stars, you're not going to see any of the shooting stars. Yeah. And so maybe if you check the weather forecast, maybe the clouds clear up after midnight, then of course, then you want to go out. Or if the clouds come in after midnight, then you probably want to go out in the early evening and look up at the sky and try to see some shooting stars before you get, you know, washed out because of the clouds. So it all depends on your weather. And of course, uh, you know, what you need to do the next day in terms of being able to stay up late to see the shooting stars. Yep. And uh but by the way, why it's better to look in the morning is usually because for most of them, we're turning into the stream, the motion. So you're, it's kind of like uh, you get more rain on your windshield, front windshield than you do on your rear one uh, because yeah, like you're moving into it. Right. And that, like I said, that depends on the radiant. So if the radiant was in a constellation, you know, that was slightly different, it might be more advantageous earlier in the evening. Right. But you're, that's generally what happens. So uh, you're turning into it, so you're going to see more. But I mean, these shooting stars, when they occur in your local area, they go across a huge range of of the sky, right? So you don't right. need even be looking directly at the radiant. You can still look straight up and and see them shooting across, you know, the sky in front of you, like that sort of thing. So, yep. but it's very predictable. And uh, and as I mentioned back in the nineteen early 1990s, when the comet passed through the inner solar system and repopulated the material, which Ultimately, that's tiny little dust particles, you know, the size of grains of sand, essentially, is the average size that come in. There were a lot more larger particles uh, at that point back in the early 90s. And at that night, I in particular, I remember watching the Perseid meteor shower. Of course, people alerted everyone for this, that there's, you know, chance going to be a really good one this year because of that comet passing through the inner solar system. And I remember that that shooting, that shower for that Perseid meteor uh, event was a lot of fireballs, as we say, and these are the much larger dust particles that really put on a fantastic display where they, you know, they're extremely bright and go from essentially almost one part of the sky right across to the other part. And so that was, and it was a lot more per hour. You're talking numbers of hundreds per hour. Right. And I, I happen to be in a, in a, a dark location. So where I am right now is where I was living back then. And it was cloudy. And I remember that I checked the weather forecast. And if you actually drove about an hour inland, you got into clear skies. And that's essentially what I did. So I went inland and 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 it was a good thing I did do that because I got to see a really fantastic meteor shower. Probably the best I've ever seen in my life. Excellent. I, I'm envious because I missed that one. Uh, but I wasn't interested in meteor showers at the time. So right. You know, but, so so the other thing that's been in the news kind of lately. So we, I wasn't around a week ago. So Dean Smith covered for me. As the other thing that happened a few days back, this would be the end of July, is that we lost contact at least for several days with the Voyager two spacecraft. Did you hear about that, Robert? At the I, time, I did, and kind of was like, God oh, dang! So we lost Voyager two. So 
I, I, I'm a little surprised we apparently got it back. Yeah, that was a bit of a sort of a sad turn of events when we first lost it. And because you'd never quite know if you regain um, contact with the spacecraft or not, and especially this type of spacecraft. It was actually launched almost exactly 46 years ago. Voyager 2 was launched on August 20th of 1977. Wow. And it was actually launched first, right? And Voyager 1 was launched second. Well, the news media at the time didn't like that. They thought whatever spacecraft gets launched first, that should be number one. <laughs> but it's, it's just that the two spacecraft were flying on slightly different paths or trajectories, as we say. And so therefore, Voyager 2, even though it was launched first from the Earth, it actually arrived at Jupiter after Voyager 1 arrived in 1979. So the first spacecraft that made it to Jupiter was launched second, and NASA named that one Voyager 1. Right. So that's how the naming convention sort of worked out here. And and why, why was is the benchmark Jupiter? Just out of right. curiosity. Yeah. So it was interesting that way back in the early 1970s, it was discovered, and you can, and this was done a lot using numerical simulations. That is using computer software to write detailed programs of orbital mechanics, where the planets are at different times, where they're going to be in the future, and what type of path do you need? to go on in terms of a spacecraft so that you could visit as many as the outer planets as you possibly can. It was found something called the Grand Tour, where you could launch a spacecraft in the late 1970s. You could have it encounter Jupiter, then use Jupiter's gravity like a slingshot effect to give it some forward momentum to head towards Saturn. That is, you get to Saturn's orbit at the point where Saturn is going to be at that location, essentially. And then you can use Saturn's gravity to slingshot you to Uranus, the next planet out from Saturn, and then eventually sling, uh, slingshot you from Uranus to get you to Neptune. So you could get all basically the four gas giants of the solar system uh, in roughly 12 years or so, that journey. And that was amazing at the time. If you just launched a spacecraft to Neptune, you know, you might have to wait, depending on the exact path of where you are in the orbital alignment, you might wait decades to get there, to go right. to Neptune. So this was a way of getting uh, out to the outer solar system rapidly. And that was important because, you know, you could be on these missions and maybe it takes 10 years to finally launch a spacecraft. And then you got to wait 10 or 20 years for it to get to its destination. And then you analyze the data for 10 years. Well, then your career is done. You're retired, you see? <laughs> right. So one one mission could be your flag your flagship mission of your career, like the only thing you really did in, right. in your professional career. So this was a way of taking advantage of orbital alignments to get these spacecrafts out there as soon as possible. Now, when they were first proposed this type of mission, of course, you don't want to send one because what happens if that one spacecraft runs into trouble? So you at least should send two. And that's sort of a backup mission. In fact, they, you would love to send three, four. Five. <laughs> but of course, in the 1970s, I mean, this was an era of inflation. There, there wasn't a lot of money. The United States, who launched these spacecraft, was coming out of the Vietnam War. So there was a lot of money that, that had to be paid to cover the expense related to that. And so there are a lot of things going on budget-wise. The economics wasn't great, wasn't conducive to sending off multiple spacecraft that take advantage of these alignments. And some of these alignments are such that they only come around every 200 and some years. Right. So you want to take advantage of it as you can. So we are fortunate enough that NASA was able to uh, send two spacecraft, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Now, there's a lot of history. You could do a whole podcast and not even, you know, just barely cut the surface of all the intriguing facts and, and discoveries that these spacecraft made. It wasn't the first time that manned, uh, the unmanned spacecraft that was launched you know, from the United States or any other country passed by Jupiter and Saturn. That was actually done by the Pioneer 10 and 11 missions. But what Voyager did is, the Voyager 2, it actually went on to fly by Uranus and Neptune, and no other spacecraft had ever done that before. So our really close-up views of what these planetary systems were like uh, came through the uh, relay of information from the Voyager 2 spacecraft of Uranus and Neptune. Now, you might wonder, why didn't Voyager 1 fly by those planets as well? Well, it turns out the way the orbital alignment worked, the trajectory that Voyager 1 was on, 
is that we want it to fly very close to the largest moon of Saturn. So you know that moon, Robert? That'd be Titan. That'd be Titan. And Titan has an atmosphere. And so we were very interested in knowing what was that atmosphere like? You know, can you see, is the atmosphere thin enough at the wavelengths that our cameras operated on, which was mostly in the optical, is the atmosphere thin enough that you could see uh, surface features, for example? Uh, could we get some measurements of the composition of the atmosphere? And there are neat ways that you can do that. You can monitor a star that happens to pass by Titan as we're nearing it, and the light of the star passes through the atmosphere, and we can analyze spectroscopy, the analysis of how that brightness of the star dims as it light passes, skirts through the atmosphere, and so on is to uncover a whole lot of facts about the composition of the atmosphere and its pressure, how it changes with uh, altitude from, or that is from the height of Titan itself, and what is the density changes and these sort of things. But to do those type of detailed measurements, you need to get very close to that body. And so Voyager 1 actually had to pass very close to Titan. And when it did so, we discovered that it's completely cloud cover of those wavelengths that we could observe at. And so we couldn't resolve or see any features on its land, on its surface. So that was sort of a disappointment in that sense. But because we flew very close to Titan, we eliminated the possibility of Voyager 1 being able to reach Uranus and Neptune. If we didn't fly so close, we could have had Voyager 1 fly on to the other two gas giants. So in hindsight, of course, which is always 2020, right? right. Uh, we would have not had Voyager 1 fly so close to Titan. But, you know, you just don't know. And so when NASA had Voyager 2 fly by uh, Saturn and its moons, it made sure to follow the path that would allow it to continue on to Uranus and then on to Neptune. Right. So that's, and, what's hap that's what happened there. And, and I will argue that it's kind of nice that Voyager 1 took the path it did because it set up, we probably wouldn't have had another mission later, Cassini, uh, if it had found what it was looking for and been able to image the surface of Titan, because that was one of the main missions of Cassini. That's and, right. And the Huygens probe. Yes, and Huygens, remember, and we did refer to that in previous podcasts. Huygens is the one that was built by the Europeans that actually landed on the surface of Titan. Right. And we got our first view, an image taken from the surface. So you can kind of see what it looks like. In fact, the Cassini mission did radar mapping of Titan. Right as well as using ultraviolet and near-infrared cameras to actually penetrate through the clouds, allow us to see the light coming reflected directly off the surface. It, so we able to see surface features. Yeah, it did some mass spectroscopy and tasted the atmosphere too, didn't it? That's right. And the atmosphere is mostly made of a nitrogen. So it's a nitrogen rich atmosphere and it's very cold. And we think that one of the things that could possibly exist is uh, sort of like petrochemicals. Right. Right. That they would be liquid form. So you have lakes made of, you know, octane type of stuff, stuff that you could almost put in your gas tank, right? And run it on in your engine on it, right? That's kind of thing. <laughs> so like petroleum based. So maybe in the future, you know, maybe Titan would be a re, uh, deposit of where we would stop to fill up or something. I don't know, whatever. Right. right. <laughs> Hopefully by then we're not burning, you know, hydrocarbons. <laughs> that's the real trick. But yes, I mean, it's entirely possible. So, uh, you know, that's kind of neat. And right. we've, we've actually seen that, you know, the mapping, you see like dried up tributaries and we've detected uh, sunlight reflected off the surface of these lakes. Right. And we know it's not water because water at those temperatures is extremely cold. That's going to be solid ice. And I mean, really solid, like rock hard. Rock like, hard solid. <laughs> yeah. And so it's it's other things, you know, ethylene and, and, and all these kind of things that can be in, in, the, in those uh, liquid phases at those really cold temperatures. Right. The temperatures I'm trying to remember, I think they're, you're talking about values around 80 Kelvin or so. So extremely cold in yeah. type of environment. It just, it's just warmer than liquid nitrogen. So the nitrogen isn't freezing out. Right. But, and the inter interesting thing now, what happened recently is that uh, we are still in contact with these Voyager spacecraft, both of them, Voyager 1 and 2, after, you know, 46 years since their launch. And the reason for that is because they are not powered by batteries. Of course, they would run down and, and you never last the long voyage that we need them to last to send back information and so on to communicate with them. They actually run by radioactive materials, plutonium. 
And plutonium, as it decays, it gives off heat. And eventually, the whole series of radioactive decays will get you to iron, uh, to get you to lead, sorry. And but as plutonium decays, because of the heat that's given off, we can use something called a thermocouple. So, Robert, do you want to explain what a thermocouple is? Uh, to, as much as I can, uh, a thermocouple is simply a, a combination of two different types of metals so that when there's a temperature difference on them, they'll actually conduct, create and conduct an electric current. Yeah, that's right. That's the basic principle of it. And in fact, you know, scientists have used those to probe the temperature down underneath in the ground right here on Earth. Right. They'll stick one end of the thermocouple there and the other end somewhere else or in a controlled sort of situation where they know what the temperature is exactly. And that difference then in the voltage would give you correspond or you can at least calibrate it to what the temperature is at the other end of the thermocouple that you may be planted 50 feet underground, for example. Right. And Wonder Goon has asked a question. He asks, uh, uh, do you feel that NASA will continue the Voyager program, a Voyager 3 perhaps? Well, I mean, we've already have done that in a sense. We've sent out the New Horizons spacecraft, and that went on a direct flight to Pluto. That was its mission. Then after that, we flew by some of the Kuiper Belt objects, and that's a continuing extended mission now. They're looking for other Kuiper Belt objects that this spacecraft could potentially fly by. But yeah, we couldn't make use of the grand alignment to do the grand tour with New Horizons spacecraft. It flew by Pluto in the summer of 2015, but that was our first good view because the Voyagers couldn't fly by Pluto and also fly by the other four gas giants, right? It, would, it wouldn't be able to reach Pluto. But we've covered Pluto now. So we have flew by every all the traditional nine planets of the solar system, which remember was changed to eight planets just a few years back. And so we have at least done flybys of them. So now going forward, we'll have probably dedicated missions that will go into orbit now of those planets. And if you go into orbit, the advantages, of course, is that you can stay for you know months and years uh, doing all types of measures, measurements and watching how things change over time. Because these planets do have seasons. They're just typically a lot longer than the Earth, of course, you know, given the type of planet that you're on. And because the orbit is so much different, it takes a lot longer to go around once in orbit. I mean, Pluto's orbit is, what, 248 years to go around once? Right. Around the so if you, if you were born on Pluto, you'd be ripped off because your birthday would never come. <laughs> you'd have to wait 200 and whatever, 48 years, let's say, and you don't live that long. Let's say even if you live to be 100, that's not even halfway around the orbit once, so you never get back to the starting point of your orbit, which would signify your birthday, you see? Right. So you... you you'd, yeah, you'd lose it on all those hundred, hundred times of getting presents, you know, in your lifetime, right? <laughs> you wouldn't even get it once. <laughs> exactly. Uh -huh. so those, those types. Of, and then obviously um, orbital type missions will be followed with landers. Right. right. And if you can't land on the planet, you can send in atmospheric probes that parachute and take measurements as it's falling down, you know, in the planet's outer atmosphere until it gets so dense it crushes under extreme pressure and density, whatever spacecraft you sent. But of course, we can explore their moons and have landers land on those as well. Right. Which so it's, there's yeah. long range planning for that on like Europa. Uh, Enceladus, I think, is in got some people making minor plans for one there. Uh, and we've kind of discussed why those are interesting to us, but yeah. And then there's the dragonfly mission that's <clears throat> going to land on Titan. Ah, and so that's, so they are going back there. Cool. Yeah. So that's a helicopter like mission, just like we have the helicopter that's flying around on Mars right now, the perseverance mission, right? And that was just an engineering test. And so they done multiple flights, like I think it's in the 50 or above times that they flew that helicopter on the thin atmosphere of Mars, you just have specially designed rotors and they, they move, they have a, they go around a lot faster. So the RPMs are a lot higher than typically what you'd have here on the earth to create enough lift. And of course it doesn't weigh, it's only a few grams, you know, in terms of its mass, right. but that's the type of design they're going to use for Titan. It has a much thicker atmosphere. So it should be a little, and it's smaller than Mars. So it's less gravity you have to worry about. So it'd be a lot easier to lift something. So therefore you can just make the payload a little heavier. Yep. And you have on board, you know, like, uh, and which like the one on Mars, you ha have on board camera. So you can take pictures of the, the, the ground and so on. But you can do a lot of exploration with these type of, essentially what they are is drones. And you can see how much drone technology has advanced 
And so you imagine just sending up a bunch of drones to all the different planets that have atmospheres. It wouldn't work if it was a vacuum, of course, right? There's no air that you can use to create your lift. So there you're stuck with, you know, roaming around probably in a, some wheeled vehicle like we do on the moon and also have rovers on the Mar on Mars, of course. Uh, but anything that has an atmosphere like, you know, like Titan, then we can use these type of drones to fly around. Yep. And I think it's interesting that we went from talking about balloon with, you know, dirigible type craft to now we're talking drone type craft uh, to go to these places. So, yeah. Yeah. And so what happened back at the end of July was there was actually a human error that was made. It was uh, the soft, the instructions, I guess, the software uh, code that they transmit to the spacecraft. There was an, an error into it, which is kind of weird because you think that it, before you push the button to send a command to the Voyager spacecraft, and by the way, when you send that command, it gets beamed there at radio frequency. So it's traveling at the speed of, lo uh, the speed of light. And Voyager 2 is so far away, it takes 18 and a half hours at the speed of light to reach that spacecraft one way. And so you don't really even realize for over a day that, oops, we made a mistake. Well, that's it, right? You wait 30 some hours for the return signal to, to be picked up type of thing. And you can see it. So on that slide, if you go to the slide of, I don't know which one you're on now. Are you on the Voyager I'm 2 I'm on slide? the Voyager 2 slide. So you want to read off the distance and use the AU and then, then tell people what the AU really means? Okay, the distance to Voyager 2 is 100, <clears throat> 134 AU. Astronomical units is what an AU is. And what that means is, is 1 AU is equal to the average, uh, the mean distance between the Earth and the Sun. So it is Voyager 2 is 134 times the Earth-Sun distance away from us. Right. And that Earth-Sun <clears throat> distance is almost 150 million kilometers. Right. And for for those, let's see, if I remember my conversion right, it's 93 million miles for freedom units. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so then you take 93 million miles multiplied by 134. That's the distance of Voyager 2. And it's not the furthest spacecraft out there. Voyager 1 is actually the furthest. It's about 160 AU away. Right. And these spacecraft, Voyager 1 and 2, are so far away from the sun now that they're picking up if you like, the background charged particles that are emitted from stars, the stars that make up our Milky Way, the interstellar charged in, uh, environment in which these particles are, you know, are found. So if you get outside the influence of the sun enough, then you're starting to pick up, if you like, the charged particles that are coming off the stars. If you're close to the sun, those particles get deflected by the magnetic field that's in our solar system because of the presence of the sun and so on. And we're starting, and that that boundary is not solid, right? It fluctuates because the the amount of charged particles. Think of the density; it changes all the time. All the time. So sometimes it's a low value, and you feel the influence of the sun more, and then other times less of the sun and more of the interstellar medium, in terms of the charged particles from all the collection of all the stars in our Milky Way galaxy. And so we're sort of on that edge now. So some people say we're outside the solar system. Well, that's not strictly true. There are other parts of the solar system, like the Oort cloud, that's, as far as we know, it's made up of bodies like comets and even maybe asteroids and so on, that it's included as part of our solar system. In fact, one could argue that our solar system really, its influence goes all the way out to maybe one to two light years. Right. Because, so that's, yeah, yeah it, it gets into what's your definition of the limit, the edge of the solar system? Is it where... The magnetic field of the sun stops, in which case they're both pretty much, they're at the point of leaving. Or is it the gravitational influence, which can extend out to a light year or two? So before the, the sun's gravity is now so inconsequential that the, the galactic field is what dominates. So, that, yeah. Yeah, and like I said, these things have been traveling for 46 years now. And the, their power, that is the ability to operate their radio and some instruments, comes from the decay of plutonium. Well, eventually that the plutonium decays to the point where it's essentially not enough left to generate the, num the amount of heat that you need through a thermocouple to generate the power you need to supply enough energy to run the radios. And so the communication on these spacecraft, that is the radios, will be silenced. 
and at a matter of a few years from now. Now, people try to guess, well, when is this going to be? The latest estimate I heard is around 2025. That's, you know, two years away or so. That's going to be a sad day. I'm sorry to say, but that's going to be a sad day. Definitely, because right now they're providing very valuable information about the environment of what it's like that far away from our sun. And it's going to be a while before we get out that far again to be able to, you know, to communicate that type of scientific data back to us and, and then beyond that distance, right? It's going right. to take a dedicated type of mission to do that. But unfortunately, that's that's the way it goes. I mean, it was never designed really to go that far and do this much, I don't think. I mean, they were probably thinking around the year, uh, maybe we'll get to 2000, 2010 with it. And anything could happen any time where it just breaks, right? And you just never right. know. So it wasn't designed to last, you know, 200 years or anything like that. That wasn't part of it. So, but in the future, I'm sure we'll send out stuff hopefully faster. Mm -hmm. We don't have to wait 46 years to get to these sort of distances. Maybe <laughs> we can get them in 10 years. And also maybe they can survive long enough that we can go, you know, maybe a thousand times this distance and still be able to send back data to us. Right. And so, we, we've yeah. proven we can go faster because we mentioned New Horizons. New Horizons is actually going faster than either of these. So That's right. Yeah. And one way you can do it is you can reduce the amount of mass that each spacecraft has. So because of the miniaturization of electronics, we can make things, you know, jam in such a small little part like a chips and stuff and do a lot of things that you couldn't do even in the 1970s when you're putting these spacecrafts together. The New Horizon, its functionality could be almost as much as the Voyager, but containing a much less massive type of object. So therefore you give it a, a much greater speed initially getting away from the earth and therefore be able to cover a much you know larger distance in a shorter period of time than Voyager one and two. Right. All that, that impulse and the, as it's termed the tyranny of the rocket equation, you know? Yes, that's right. <laughs> now, now it's interesting to note, like I said, these, these um, sort of commands, which are done, you know, once in a while, and it's not something new sent up to Voyager two in the end of July. Uh, there was a bug in those commands. So I don't understand how somebody could send something that was a bug in it. You think that would be not only double checked, but triple checked and quadruple checked and checked five times and six times. And, you know, you check it 20 times before you dare push the button that says send, you know, the bright orange button with the send written onto it. <laughs> you got to be a hundred percent sure that there's nothing being sent that's would cause trouble with the spacecraft. But unfortunately, uh, now, we don't know the details of what happened, but as far as we know, that is what happened. And they sent the command. The command, what caused the Voyager to turn its antenna two degrees away from the Earth. So it wasn't pointing at the Earth. And which means if you're two degrees off and you're 134 AU away, that's a huge distance in terms of, of miles or kilometers, however you want to units you want to use to measure by the time that signal reaches the Earth. Right. And so and, it just missed the Earth, and we couldn't be able to detect it. That was the problem. And and so then that causes a problem of any signal that comes from the craft or goes to the craft has to be that much more powerful to actually be picked up by the antenna. Yeah, so, and so when this initially happened, NASA was like, okay, we probably are not going to – we'll try, but we probably won't be able to fix this problem. But thankfully – the software engineer, so give a thumbs up to anybody who is in the development of this software for the Voyager missions. They programmed in that every once in a while, every few months, Voyager would do this self-diagnostic sort of routine that would make sure that it was aligned correctly. It would look at, it has a star tracker, so it can point at different stars, knowing the position of those stars, knowing uh, how its antenna, its dish antenna is pointed. And it would know, and this would occur on October the 15th of this year, that it would know it wasn't pointing towards Earth the way it should be, and it would reorient itself so that would then point towards Earth, and we'd be able to communicate it with it directly then uh, by the middle of October. So we just had to wait, had to be patient. But in this last, this sort of, you know, if you like a Hail Mary pass, NASA said, well, let's try. And they used, uh, you know, the deep space network that we have for these lots of these large, you know, radio telescopes on the Earth to listen to the Voyager spacecraft, and they detected the carrier signal from it. So there was no data, just kind of a hum. It's like when your radio station goes off the air, you can kind of tell there's something there. There's like no noise, like a dead signal, but there's no useful information that's being broadcast, like a song or somebody talking. So we picked up the carrier signal, and that was 
have great hope that, well, if we can detect the carrier signal, maybe we can then transmit a, a command to Voyager and it might pick it up to tell it to reorient itself to point directly to Earth. And so they did that. And this was done, I think, around August the 4th or so, if I'm not mistaken. And a signal was sent to the spacecraft. Of course, they had to wait 18 and a half hours for the signal to get there. Voyager 2 would do its thing and then send a signal back to Earth to say, okay, I, I'm, I'm following the command you sent me. And you'd have to wait 18 and a half hours for that signal to come back. So it's like, what, 37 hours or something in total. And they did pick up the signal. It did change its orientation. is now communicating directly with the Earth like it was supposed to. So it's a big event. <laughs> So Ooh, we pulled did, that one we off. Didn't, yes, we didn't lose Voyager. And you just never know. Maybe on in the middle of October, it wouldn't have worked, and we'd never hear from Voyager again. Right. Because so the longer just, this goes on, the further away it is, and the less likely you are to get back control. And the other yeah. thing is, you don't know 100% sure that it wasn't some other problem that compounded the issue. Right. And that's so. the thing, too. You have to worry. But yes, we sent up a command. I know what command I sent, so I can analyze it in detail and find the mistake. And that's how they knew it was pointing off by two degrees. But then what happens if something else happened at the same time? You just never know, right, with these spacecraft, because they are old, so anything could go at any time. And right. so, and then how do you diagnose that problem? How do you try to do workarounds if you can't communicate with the spacecraft? So then in the time that it's silent all the way till the middle of October, if something went wrong, that might have been the end of the mission, see? Right. And then we'd have been left with Voyager 1. Not that that's nothing, but, yeah, you know, it's, it's not two of them anymore. It's just one. Well, it's like when one of the rovers dies on Mars, even though it lives... 20 or 30 times past its life expectancy, 20 or 30 times longer than what it was designed for, you're always sad when it dies. Right. When you it, lose communication with it, right? You know, we humans, we tend, I, I've seen several funny stories about that. We, we tend to pack bond with just about anything, you know? <laughs> we'll, we'll pack bond with a rock. Right. Because it's a, well, neat, it's a neat rock. Well, I'm thinking here like the Energizer Bunny, right? We right. Going and going and going and going, but eventually, it, it, even the Energizer Bunny will die if you don't change his batteries. Right? It's gonna end at some point. Right. Sooner or later. Sooner or later. So now, speaking about spacecraft, there was a launch that was done recently. This was on July first, if I'm not mistaken. So this was the new Euclid spacecraft. So, Robert, do you want to pull up the next slide? Oh, uh, it's pulled up. Okay. I can't see the slides. That's why I got to ask Robert to do this. So the Euclid mission is a mainly European mission, uh, European South, uh, Space Agency, ESA. So it's designed to be a new space telescope whose primary science goal is to get detailed measurements of this mysterious dark energy component of the universe. Now, we talk about the Cosmic Pie, which is the name of this podcast, but it's not just made up and it has nothing to do with dessert or 3.14159 and so on. It has to do with the fact that we'd like to look at what is the total composition of the universe. And you can think of it as a pie. So we know that 70% of the universe is made up of dark energy, and this is all the mass and energy that the universe contains. 25% is dark matter, and then that leaves 5% left, which is the whole pie, 100%. Made up of things that Robert, you and I, and everybody else on this planet are made up, you know, the normal protons, neutrons, electrons, those sort of things. And so this Euclid mission is going to measure that largest slice of the cosmic pie. It's going to look at galaxies and do, do, do detailed measurements of what we call weak lensing. So this is the distortion of the, uh, the light or the shape in this case of galaxies due to the fact that light gets its uh, path bent slightly when it passes through matter and energy. So think of dark matter that's in the universe that will alter the path of the light ever so slightly. And we can look at how this has changed with time. And that's what gives us information about the fact that the universe is expanding. We know that, but that you know, the, the accelerated expansion of the universe, we can actually more directly measure that, which is really the dark energy component, by looking to see how the shapes of these galaxies have changed, the shearing effect, as we say, have they changed looking at different distances, what we call in astronomy, redshift slices. 
And so by looking at detailed analysis and comparing the simulations and so on, we can say that has the dark energy been constant for the large part of the history of the universe, or maybe it was stronger, let's say 10 billion years ago than it is today, or maybe it was weaker. So we can put some better constraints on the evolution of dark energy, assuming it does change with time. And that we just don't know if it changes with time. We know it doesn't change, as, it doesn't change a lot with time because we've been able to measure that already. But we want a very, you know, as precise measurement as we can. And that's one of the major science goal of the Euclid mission. Now, Robert, this telescope, to get away from any effect of the Earth, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope has this problem where, you know, if you're looking at a particular object, half of its orbit, it's, that object is blocked by the Earth. Right. So it takes Hubble roughly 90 minutes to do a complete orbit around the Earth. So if you're looking at a particular galaxy, let's say, 45 minutes of every 90 minute orbit is spent not looking at your object because you can't see it. The Earth is in the way. You've got to wait for the telescope to get on the other side of the Earth, on the side closest to your object, to be able to observe it. But if the telescope is far away from the Earth, like this L2 position, this is known as Lagrangian 2 position, it's about one and a half million kilometers directly away from the sun. As if you think of an imaginary line connecting the Earth, the sun, and the L2 position, the L2 position would lie behind the Earth as viewed looking towards the sun. And it's like, as I mentioned, about one and a half million kilometers on the other side of the Earth from the sun. And that, that position is nice and stable. In fact, that's the location of the James Webb Space Telescope. And from that location, Earth is very small in angular size in the sky, so it doesn't interfere with observations that you're making of the sky. You can do surveys you know, of galaxies and so on without worrying about the Earth being in the way. And of course, the only thing you have to worry about is not pointing your telescope at the sun. And so what they did is design the spacecraft so that it has a sun shield on it. And that sun shield is always pointed towards the sun. So towards the earth, which then is towards the sun to block out any of that stray light. So the spacecraft is looking then away from the sun all of the time, doing its survey as it goes in orbit around the sun. Now it's taken some preliminary data already. I believe this is on the next slide, Robert. Okay, uh, let's see, let me, there it is. So this is showing you some observations of, you know, galaxies, essentially, that some of the instruments they're testing, and it will go in full production about three months after launch. So that would be approximately in September, where it's ready to, you know, start its main science mission. So all the engineering tests have been done, and all the instruments have been checked out, and so on and so forth. The only thing I've heard, the instruments are working fine. The only thing I, I've heard about is the fact that there is a small hole in that sun shield, Probably oh. just, a, just a crack, but there is some sunlight that comes in from that shield and actually causes a pattern on the image that you see, and that pattern then can be just removed, right? Or they can point it, they can actually orient, orient uh, change the orientation of the spacecraft in such a way that the sunlight doesn't enter that hole, that crack in the sun shield. Yep. So that's something you have to watch out for. If not, you get scattered light on the images and that, that becomes hard to process later on to remove that scattered light. It's better if that scattered light is not there to begin with. And that just means doing some fine adjust adjustments to the pointing of the spacecraft. So none of that light that enters that crack in the sun shield can fall on the detector essentially. Right. Think of it as a giant camera. So if the light doesn't stray in on your camera, then you're not gonna see that glare and that you don't have to worry about it, the effect on the science data. So, you know, we stand by, it'll probably take, you know, a couple of years to get the good solid results coming from this mission, but it's basically just another stepping stone in the ultimate desire to try to figure out what the heck this dark energy is. It really is a mystery. We, we know its effect on the universe, but we don't know why it's there. We don't know why it has the strength that it does. We don't know 100% sure that it doesn't change with time. Maybe it's a absolute constant. And it's been like that since the universe came into creation, to existence. We just, that is from the Big Bang. We just don't know. And right. we don't know what's going to happen to dark energy in the future. I mean, one of the kind of scenarios that I kind of, is kind of cool. It's not, not nice if you had to live through it, but it's kind of cool. Is this idea of what we call the Big Rip scenario. And that's the idea where dark energy increases its strength with time. 
So as tens of billions of years go by, as the universe continues to get ever larger and larger and larger, space expands at such a rate that literally, this, if you think of the space between an electron and a proton, the amount of dark energy that would reside in that space would become so great, it actually would force apart those particles. So the, no atoms would exist. All atoms would be completely unstable. Right. And theoretically, wouldn't it keep on going then until finally, you know, protons, the quarks couldn't stay together? Yeah, exactly. Right. So you could think of the universe as being one nucleus in some sense, right? There is no confinement in, unless you think of confinement to the universe, you know, right. If you get into like the top. So you know, for those of you who are not familiar with it, one of the great mysteries we had when we look at what's in, what makes up the fundamental nature of things is you take like a piece of bread, you cut it in half with a knife. What do you have uh, left when you cut it in half? You have bread or you just have two pieces of it, right? Right. If you take an ever finer knife and you cut a half of a half, a half, a half, a half, a half, and you keep going like that, eventually you come to a little strand of fiber of bread and you can't cut it anymore. So you change your knife and make it some other instrument. And eventually you get it down until, if you can do it, to the you know individual atoms. Right. And then you wonder what's in individual atoms. And so we know there's proton, neutrons, and electrons. And so you can take a proton, for example, and wonder, is there anything inside of a proton? Is there some smaller structure? So one of the things we do in science, essentially, in physics, is we take a proton and think of it as a bag of marbles. That's the analogy I like to use. And you shake it. Well, how can you tell if a bag has marbles in it? Well, you can feel the marbles moving around inside of it. And so if you can detect any motion of particles inside of a proton, then you know that the proton is not the basic constituents of matter. There's something more fundamental inside of it. And that's the idea of these quarks. Right. And then you I, can ask, are there any, anything inside of these quarks? Well, not only can't we tell, but we can't take individual quarks and pull them apart. We don't, when you put in the energy, <laughs> pull two quarks apart or three quarks in the case of the proton, uh, new, par new quarks appear out of that energy. Right. And you can never get an isolated quark. And that's known as quark confinement. Right. You can think of it as a rubber band. Right. When a rubber band is, is a, uh, relaxed and you had two pieces, of, let's say a particle on one end of rubber, a rubber band and another particle on the other, if they're close together, there's no force bringing those particles together due to the rubber band because it's relaxed. But if you stretch that rubber band, then clearly when you start stretching it, when it's out of its unstable shape, right, you're making it larger, there is a force that's drawing those particles together. And the more you stretch that rubber band, the stronger is that force. That's sort of like quark confinement. As you draw these quarks away from each other, there's more of a force to draw them together. Yep. We do have another question from yep. Wondergoon. Uh, they're looking at uh, the ESA images and ask, uh, in the lower right image, there's a straight line. Is that a galaxy edge? And I know you can't see it, so I'm looking at it, and it took me a little bit, but I finally saw what they were asking about, and there's just a little straight white sequence in there. And what that is, is that's the bane of all CCD cameras. Those are bad pixels. No, no. Those are good pixels. I'm Those sorry, Rob. Those are good pixels. Okay. Yeah, so what is that? that? That is a cosmic ray. Ah, I've never seen one make a straight line like that. They're usually yeah, squiggles. I, no, not they come in straight, the cosmic rays. If you look at the raw, unprocessed HST data, it is full of these straight lines, little line segments everywhere, different orientations. Those are cosmic rays. I'll be darned. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I learned something then today. Yeah. Heck yeah. When you're like one and a half million kilometers away, you're outside the Van Allen radiation belt. So you're getting the full blast of cosmic rays in the solar system at that location. Okay. So they wouldn't be influenced by the Earth's magnetic field or the magnetic field of the, the Van Allen belts or any of this stuff. So, wow. Yeah. Okay. I guess they would form just plow right through the, the chip and make a straight line. Okay. Yeah. And they come in at different angles. So sometimes the line is shorter than others. And okay. so, yeah, so that's a cosmic ray hit. I mean, it's clearly not going to be shooting stars at the L2 position. There's no atmosphere around it. It's in a vacuum of space, right? What's going to burn up the meteor, you know, the micrometeorite, right? And, the, and there's no other satellites to streak across not, or airplanes. Not that, yeah, not that far, unless there's something in the L2 position that it picked up that it's tracking. That would be the only thing. But that, and I don't know for sure, but it looks exactly like a cosmic ray streak. Exactly. Okay. Like I said, I'm used to it being little squiggles, but that's because here on Earth, they plow into the surface of the CCD 
and deposit all that energy and it just kind of spurts out across the chip. Yeah. So yeah, this one, it just plows and grazes right through it. Okay. Yeah. And, and it looks very characteristic like an HST image. Okay. So an HST, you know, like I said, before you clean up and do the raw processing, there is tons of cosmic ray impacts that you have to get rid of. Right, because there's no correcting for that. You just have to erase them. <laughs> well, there is a correcting, and here's the correcting. Oh. Instead of taking a single image, let's say you're pointed at a galaxy, you take multiple images, and each cosmic ray is totally coming in at random. Right. So what you can do is you can combine those images to get rid of any pixels that are, are bright that are not found in all the other images. Okay. That would so work, can, yeah. Yeah, so you reject any of those pixels. So maybe instead of you have five images, it would, a particular uh, pixel of the uh, final image is only consists of four of those images. The one that was in the fifth image had a cosmic ray uh, um, disturbance. So it was a bright pixel because of a cosmic ray impact. And you just reject that pixel. So you only combine the four of them that didn't have a cosmic ray impact. I, I guess in the, the last few minutes of the show, I guess we should comment on what are cosmic rays. Yeah, so you want to go ahead and elucidate that a little bit? Okay. Uh, cosmic rays are essentially just charged particles. So electrons, protons are nuclei because we have detected uh, iron nucleus, nuclei, I suppose I should say, uh, that are coming in at very, very, very high rates of speed. Um, so when they impact, they've got all this kinetic energy and it goes somewhere. In this case, it goes to releasing electrons out of the CCD chip. And, well, what are we collecting? Well, we're collecting photons that release electrons from the CCD chip. So this is why you see them as hot pixels, as bright pixels on a CCD, is because all that energy gets converted to what the little pixels measure, which is electrical current. So... What they are is charged particles that have been accelerated one way or another to very high rates of speed. Right. In fact, cosmic rays, since they're produced mainly, well, they're produced by lots of things in our universe. They're produced by black holes, actually. Uh, supermassive black holes that are found in the middle of most galaxies. And some galaxies are very active. We call those active galactic nuclei, AGN for short. And what they are are supermassive black holes, which means millions to billions of times the mass of our own sun that sits at the center of these galaxies. And outside of the black hole, they have gas and dust and so on that we call an accretion disk. And as that material spirals inwards and before it crosses the event horizon, that's the point of no return where no signal can get out to the outside universe, they, that material gets heated up dramatically. And that material gets so hot, it emits, you know, a lot of these electromagnetic radiation associated with that material is magnetic fields that get spun up and confined, and they can emit jets of charged particles. It's a really hot environment, so essentially what you create is a plasma-like situation that is um, atoms that have been stripped of one or more electrons. So you have a lot of charged particles running around, and they actually get ejected away from the systems. And these high, fast-moving particles then can go outwards into the galaxy. And so you have lots of locations where this can occur, including, you know, and lower energies such as cosmic ray particles coming from our sun and so on, that eventually you're sort of in this background field of cosmic rays. In fact, we know that during the solar flares of our sun, you can get a lot of release of these charged particles. And that was one of the things we had to look out for in the late 1960s and the early 1970s when we send humans to the moon that there could have been a big solar eruption on the sun as the Apollo spacecraft was on its way from the earth to the moon outside of the protective environment of our magnetic field. And you'd get a huge influx of these charged particles that would pass through the spacecraft and through the bodies of the astronauts. And we know that the interaction of these charged particles can cause mutations in the cells of, of living things. In fact, it can you know, cause the increased chance of you getting cancer a little later on in your life. Right. So all of the Apollo astronauts uh, carry detect detectors on themselves that would monitor that type of environment. How many of these cosmic rays have I been exposed to the radiation environment? And is it above a certain level that it would be extremely harmful? 
Luckily, there was no such activity that happened when the Apollo astronauts were in the Apollo program doing their thing. And so they didn't have to really worry about it. But you can imagine once we start going back to the moon, there are going to be times like now where the sun ramps up its solar activity and there can be, you know, events happening where you have a big coronal mass ejection or solar flare on the sun. And that sends a tremendous amount of charged particles towards the Earth moon system. And if you happen to be, you know, transiting between our planet and the moon and you get caught in that, you're going to get exposed. And so there are things you can do. You know, obviously we have astronauts on board the International, International Space Station. So there are parts of the space station that contains more shielding than others. For example, you can have areas where they have tanks maybe with water located in them and you can try to get the tank of water that's in the way of the direction of which we expect the cosmic rays to be coming from if they're produced by the sun. You could do that as well if you're you know, going from the earth to the moon. You can change the orientation of your spacecraft so you put as much shielding as you can between the incoming direction of the cosmic rays and you where you're located. Right. And yeah. any, dis any discussion of cosmic rays, I have to mention that there was one that was detected that was of exceptional note because it came in with so much energy that this is an atomic nucleus that came in with enough energy that it had been like being hit by a fastball from a, a major league pitcher. So yeah. one atom, one nucleus hit with enough force, hit our atmosphere with enough force that it would have been like being hit by a fastball pitch. Right, and the thing with the particle though, is that it's not like a fastball smacking aside the face and you get a big bruise, hopefully it don't, doesn't kill you, of course, is that this particle will rip right through your body doing damage along that whole track, potentially. Right. You know, destroying, you know, your cells, cellular structure along that path. And, and like I said, it's been known to link to cancer. Right. So, it, And it's, it, it's a lot worse than just a beam hole straight through you because as it hits another atom, it loses some of its energy, but it shatters that atom, which sends a scat shower of particles that gets bigger and bigger and bigger in a cascade. So these are not things you want to get hit by. That's right. I mean, if you've seen the movie Oppenheimer, right? So there's mm -hmm. talk about chain reaction type of things. And this is what we mean by chain reaction. It's like a, a domino game where you tip over one domino and you have it set up. So then two tip over, then three, then four, and just, you know, then eight, then 16, then 32, and so on, right? Right. So that's the kind of things that we're talking about here. These shower particles then spread through your body, causing, you know, major damage to your DNA and everything. They, you know, they have so much energy, they can destroy that. And it might take a while, you know, it might be 10 or 20 years before you develop cancer, but it could be a direct cause of because of this huge exposure to uh, cosmic rays when you were traveling from the earth to the moon during a very special time in your life or something, right? Right. And I think we're getting close to the end of our time today. So uh, for the we week. Are getting, yeah, we are getting close. And so if you're interested in astronomy or astrophysics or science in general, I mean, one of the things we always show, of course. the beginning of the fall semester for us robert that starts essentially the the full day on august the 22nd right first full and day <laughs> first full day and um the next podcast will be on august the 15th so next tuesday i will be back robert so Woot. we'll be back to our normal sort of routine of doing this together in the same studio and that's at 3 p.m central daylight time and if this turns out okay or if it doesn't and we figure out how to work the bugs out of it we will be having other guests that will be joining us from afar. So that will improve hopefully the quality of our podcast as we bring in different people and then you just don't have to listen to Robert and I every week talking about various things. Right. And we can bring so, in experts on some of these topics. So somebody actually knows something about astronomy. Right. And physics, right. right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking a little more on some of the more physics related and chemistry and, and, you know, maybe get in some geosciences, but, you know, that should be part of our disclaimer, Robert. We should be saying at the beginning uh, that uh, we may not know anything about what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Now, one of the things, so yeah, so if you're interested in, in science and physics in general and so on, uh, please don't hesitate to either get a hold of Robert or I. You can find us at University of North Dakota and Department of Physics and Astrophysics. 
And also, you know, feel free to take courses here at UND or do online courses if getting physically to campus uh, is impossible. And I, online is a great thing. So. I switched back from our slide that was usually on that because I realized I hadn't put Wayne's mic uh, on on it so you couldn't hear him for a second. So that's what happened there. Uh, okay. Yeah, so. so like I said, online, you know, take advantage of it if you can't come physically to the campus. I mean, you can be anywhere in the world and beyond to be able to take online courses as long as you can get on the internet somehow. And and it's becoming much easier to do that as time goes forward, right? We go yep. into the future. Yes. Now, we always end with a quote. So today's quote, Robert, is from Vincent Van Gogh. You might have heard of him. Now, what's he famous for, Robert? Uh, losing his ear. Oh, wait, no, <laughs> painting. His exquisite <laughs> use of color and form. There we go. You're culturally then intelligent, Robert. I know this. <laughs> You're well versed in all of the humanities besides you know, having a science background. I, I, I don't think you can be a good scientist without being well versed in that type of thing. Uh, touché, so. touché. Okay, so <laughs> the quote for today from Vincent van Gogh is, I have a terrible need, shall I say the word, of religion. Then I go out at night and paint the stars. Nice. So with that, I'm going to see you next week. Robert, thanks for doing this podcast, this very special podcast of me being on remote location. And thank all of you for watching and listening. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up and subscribe. Have a good week, everybody.